Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Anna Inario, and I'm part of the team here who puts on the park forum. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, we are very excited to have one of our own alumni. Um, Dr. Takayama uh, was here as an intern um, here at Park several years ago, and um, she is currently a professor at UC Santa Cruz in the psychology department, um, and she has a degree in, um, let's see, in, from Berkeley in psychology and cognitive sciences, and then went on to get a master's of communication and a PhD at Stanford. She is an aspiring surfer, as well as um, uh, a skier, as well as a figure skater. So uh, just on the side, she does, deals with robots as well. So. Please put your hands together for um, Dr. Takayama. <laughs> that was nice. Um, yeah, thanks for having me back here. Um, it's been a while since I've been in this building. I won't say how many years, but I spent about one summer here interning um, with the group that was doing user interface research with Stu Card, and it was so much fun that I refused to leave. So <laughs> during grad school, I actually interned here for about three years without Stanford knowing, and it was amazing. Um, so I, it's really good to be back. Um, I kind of want to tell you a little bit about uh, where this all started, just so you understand the context of the work. Um, there's this little place that was called Willow Garage that was down in Menlo Park, and actually the CEO of that company was Steve Cousins, who is also a Xerox Park alum, uh, along with my office mates, who are Bob Bauer and Dave Robson, also from Xerox Park. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of good blood flowing through these, these companies. Um, at Willow Garage, we were working on open source personal robotics, um, which is kind of a lot of words. Uh, it was an amazing place and an amazing set of people. Um, it doesn't exist anymore, but the legacy is living on through a lot of other startups like places like Savvy Oak. Um, we got to, of course, we're at Park, right? We have to talk about this. So uh, when we were thinking about moving from mainframes to personal computers, there were many, many issues that came up that were actually fundamentally human, right? How are we going to design these really complex systems in ways that end users and new people, um, a broader swath of the world population can actually handle these things and make use of them and use them as just tools. Um, similarly, uh, in robotics, now there's a dream, right, of making the personal robot. Like, what would it look like for a robot to run around and do useful things for normal, everyday people? Um, this is the PR1 uh, that Stanford worked on. Um, that was Keenan Weirbeck uh, and Eric Berger. And when Steve Cousins and Scott Hassan saw this thing, uh, they decided we needed to make a real one. So this one's made out of wood and fabric. It's very warm and cute and can do lots of things around the house. Uh, at Willow Garage, we made PR2, Personal Robot 2. And this is a almost 500 pound, almost $500,000 mobile manipulation platform with 32 degrees of freedom, which is a really fancy way of saying it's a robot that runs around and grabs stuff. Um, you can kind of see what that looks like there. Um, again, you know, back to the roots, right? We're talking about human-computer interaction, and that's, that's my background. Um, that's my home. Um, and here at Park, right, there was all these explorations around what should that interface look like? How should people, how should we design systems that are actually human-centered um, from the very, very beginning? Um, similarly, there's now a community called the Human-Robot Interaction Community. If you look on the ACM Digital Library, you can see HR is much, much younger <laughs> than Kai. Um, and much, much smaller. So I go to both conferences all the time. If this talk is interesting at all to you, I'd strongly recommend you coming and checking out this one. Kai is great. HR is like 10 times smaller. Um, we're very cozy and a lot of fun. It asks really interesting questions that need help from brains like yours. Um, out in the real world, there actually are robots that are looking more like personal robots and domestic robots. These are the three that actually I have in my home. Um, in case you're not familiar with them, this little Nito runs around and sucks dirt so that I don't have to vacuum all the time. He vacuums every single day um, and makes for some interesting stories at dinner. Um, this is the Litter Robot 3, um, and it has fundamentally changed my relationship with my cat. <laughs> I used to scoop his poop 14 times a week, and now I scoop it once a week. And that has fundamentally changed our relationship for the better. Um, <laughs> This last one over here is called the, the Landroid. It's made by a company called Works that makes a lot of power tools for lawn, lawns. And he cuts the grass every single day, kind of the way that the, the Nito sucks dirt every day. And it's amazing. <laughs> um, you know, there was this vision that Bill Gates talked about back in 2007 where we're going to have a robot in every home. And, you know, you can actually see some of these existing 
already. But then there's these other robots up here that are looking a little more complex and humanoid. And of course, those are being done in research labs, mostly in academia um, right now. This should look familiar to those of you here from Park, right? Looking at, you know, what would that computing system be for the 21st century? And talking about ubiquitous computing and how do we put computing into things such that they become more invisible and used and just part of the fabric of everyday life as opposed to these monolithic machines that sit in front of us and that we stare at all day long. Um, this is actually incredibly inspiring for me and I spent a few years at Stanford in the library archives looking at Mark Weiser's archives um, and that's what inspired actually me to kind of go in this direction. Um, I think it's a, a fascinating idea to think of computing as something that is just in the air and in the water and in the walls um, and enables people to do things that we couldn't do before but that don't demand our attention all the time. Um, right, so if we think of ubiquitous computing, Mark Weiser called it also embodied virtuality, right? And it's this contrast against virtual reality. So in VR, we're trying to put the world and put it into a virtual world um, that we can then experience, maybe in a heads-up display, um, maybe in a cave. And embodied virtuality is this idea instead that you're going to push the computation out into the world. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Um, because I like the real world and I think there's a lot of things that we can do here too that are different from VR. Um, a lot of people will tell me, okay, yeah, so I've got a supercomputer in my pocket and that's pretty awesome. And it's just a tool. It's just a computer. And rationally, yes, that is absolutely true. That is a man-made object. Um, but I will argue that actually there are going to be times when it feels like it's more or less than that just a tool. And what do I mean by that? So if your cell phone started ringing right now, <laughs> thankfully there's really bad signal in this room, so that's probably not going to happen. Um, but if your phone did ring right now, it would feel pretty agentic and you're kind of out of control of it, right? Um, at the same time, when I'm talking to my grandma on the phone on Maui, right, I'm not actually thinking about my phone as being a phone. It's, it's not an object. I'm just talking to my grandma. I'm not sending signals over a network such that get reproduced on her headset, right? That's not part of my conscious experience. My conscious experience is I'm just talking to grandma. Um, and that's pretty awesome. Similarly with robots, right? If you think of controlling a robot as controlling a machine, that's fine. But also you can interact through robots in ways that just feel like you're just interacting. You're not actually controlling a machine at all, hopefully. If that user experience is awesome. And then there's interacting with robots that are a little more, or feel a little more agentic than we actually know that they are. So, you know, this was the dream <laughs> of personal robots, that they could do things like this for us. Uh, reality is not quite there yet, but, you know, maybe one day. Uh, and I would actually argue that even though there's big robot robots like that, we're actually in a world where we have robotics around us all the time, right? So if you have used an ATM recently, you just interacted with a robot. Um, if you have analog braking systems or, you know, automatic cruise control, you've kind of interacted with a bit of robotics already. Um, and now your thermostat, right, I guess Nest is right next door, uh, is now learning about your, your preferences and then making more um, forceful <laughs> suggestions about what it thinks you want the temperature to be in your home. There are more, of course, robot robot um, products out in the world. Um, but I'd, I just want to argue that a lot of the things that you're going to see today that are about robotics and robots um, can apply to many other kinds of products that are out there already. In case you haven't seen these, the one that might not be familiar, that one on the end is actually a window washing robot that works with magnets, and so people don't have to climb up sky rise uh, buildings to go and clean windows. Um, there's a lot of philosophy that goes behind this that also went into ubiquitous computing, right? So when you talk about the blind man's cane, you can think about the cane as being this hard object and you can feel the wood and you know that it's a stick, or you can think of it as the thing that you just see the world through. You just perceive things through it. That's kind of beautiful. Uh, Gibson, who talked about affordances, right? He actually had this cool notion just before he retired of your car is having this tongue of possible spaces in front of you. So if you're driving a sports car that's like super fast and really maneuverable, that tongue is really long and super reactive. If you're driving kind of an older jalopy, it's a little shorter. <laughs> you gotta be a little more careful because you can't really get out of the way of the big rig that's barreling towards you so quickly. And this is changing. It's different from the stuff that we were born with, right? Now, now that I see the world from the point of view of the car that I'm driving, um, you're fundamentally re-embodied um, in this new form that you, you didn't have before. Of course, there's many other objects uh, that are similar to this uh, that I think are going to pose interesting questions for human psychology uh, and embodied cognition. All right. So, I'm going to talk a bit about, give you a few examples of what work would look like in this space. Um, first, starting with things that feel, feel more agentic, like this guy. Um, things that feel a little more invisible in use, and then things that are a little bit in between. 
So I mentioned we made this robot called PR2. He was kind of expensive. And we had these big debates about how we're going to market this thing. Are we going to tell people that PR2 is amazing, it is awesome, it does everything? Um, or my camp was, actually, it doesn't do that much just yet. Like, it's just a platform. <laughs> uh, we don't really know what it's supposed to do. So we can't really say that it's going to be awesome at doing it. And so there was the more, um, you know, sell it really hard versus be a little more humble. Um, and we didn't have a good answer about which way to go about it. Uh, but we did do a bunch of experiments to figure out how we should be talking about these things. Another, you know, they, robotics is hard. <laughs> Artificial intelligence is hard. Um, and this is what it looked like, just for those of you who haven't spent much time with robots. When a robot is trying to open a door, this is state of the art, right? So the robot is looking at the door with very expensive LiDAR. This is what the world looks like um, in the, the robot's mind's eye. Uh, he is finding the door. There is a shiny thing that's probably the door handle. He's now doing the motion planning to move the gripper into a spot where he can grab it. And then you cross your fingers and hope that it can open the door. And this robot would do this all day for months and months and months in our office, which it needed to do because we were debugging the system, right? Um, but the problem for me was that this was my office, that I was, that I was next to it. Um, and the coffee machine was on this side of the robot, and so I needed to get down that hallway kind of often. Uh, and so, you know, the robot would just be sitting there like this all day long, and every once in a while I'd reach out, and that's, what, that's how I perceived it, right, as a, as a non-robot whisperer. Um, and every once in a while I'd run in front of the robot, and the, my software engineer friends would be like, stop doing that, you're messing up the point cloud. Now we gotta start all over again, right? And it was like, I'm sorry, but I need to get my coffee and I don't know what the heck it's doing. Um, and so this sort of inspired um, getting some help, <laughs> uh, not from HR, but from other people who were even more fun. There was a, a, an animator, actually, who I'd met, uh, got introduced to from Pixar, and he's a character animator who knows so much more about making robots more readable than any of the rest of us did. So he, he stepped in, which was pretty great. So right now, right, this is a robot doing what it does today. It just sits there. and. It kind of ignores anybody who comes up to it because it's busy thinking about the door, right? And eventually it just reaches out. And that's okay. This is an okay behavior. But what we wanted to see is if we could do something a little bit better, right? So what if he showed that he was thinking <laughs> about it, acknowledged your existence, um, and then went for the door? Does that make a difference? And, and our studies looked into that question. Um, the other thing is that robots know their state, right? So they know what their goal is. They know if they've succeeded or failed. And most of the time, you know, open the door. Most people would be kind of happy about that, but the robot's just like, whatever. So what if the robot felt a little bit, or exhibited feelings <laughs> of being a little bit happy about opening that door? Um, this is even better, right? So most of the time it fails because this is hard. Um, and so say the door's locked, the gripper like falls off the end of the handle, robot doesn't care. This is my favorite animation in the whole set. So the robot fails and feels a little bit bad and shameful <laughs> about failing. <laughs> um, that, that one is awesome. This is all work done by Doug Dooley, by the way. Um, so, you know, as a psychologist, I was really interested in, like, does this matter? How do people perceive the system? Can they make sense of what's going on with it? So we ran this survey. Um, and we did it across a bunch of domains, so robot ushering people around, delivering a drink, opening a door, and asking for help with getting plugged into a wall. Um, half of the people in the study uh, had no reaction, um, half had a, some sort of reaction to success or failure. Um, and this, this variable was whether or not he showed the thinking about doing something before doing it or not. Um, our hypothesis was that people who saw the robots that had a little bit of forethought behavior um, would feel more positively towards it, uh, and that they'd also have more positive feelings towards those that showed reactions to success or failure. Um, yeah, that tends to be true. Uh, people feel like those robots are more approachable if they show forethought. They also feel like the robots are more appealing, which is an important dimension for character animation. Um, this is the cooler part, though. If you look at how smart people think the robot is, if it actually succeeds at opening the door or delivering the drink, they think it's smarter. That's a no duh. But if you fail and you at least feel bad about failing, you get almost the same effect size <laughs> um, of perceived competence as if you actually succeeded in the task. So I think the lesson there is um, 
This emotional expression is actually a functional behavior because it's helping people to understand what the system is doing. Those of us who don't want to look at the command line full of text skewing um, really want to know what's going on so that we can behave accordingly, right? Like I didn't want to get in the robot's way and it didn't want me to be in its way. And this is a way of helping us coordinate a little bit better together. And if your robot's gonna fail, you should at least look like you feel bad about it because you do get brownie points <laughs> for doing that. Um, I'm gonna actually bring this around full circle. So this, uh, that work that we did at Willy Garage was a while ago. Uh, and since then, actually Steve Cousins, who was CEO at Willy Garage, is now CEO at Savvy Oak. Um, and they're working on this little robot here called Relay. And for those of you who haven't seen Relay, Relay lives in hotels, and you know, if I'm a guest at a hotel and I forget, I don't know, my toothbrush at home, or I'm kind of thirsty and I, I'm in my PJs already and don't really want to go down to the lobby to get a drink, then I might call up the front desk and say, hey, um, can, I, can I get a drink up in my room? I'm in room 302, um, that'd be really great. Okay, thanks, bye, right? And so um, we're gonna just play act this for you. So Relay is gonna now go to the front desk all by himself, autonomously, um, he has mapped this space before, so yes, he does know this room. Uh, and right now what happens in hotels is when that phone call gets made, um, it's nobody's job <laughs> to run drinks up to random people's rooms. And so usually it's the hotel manager um, or somebody even higher up the chain who drops what they're doing um, and comes to your room to bring you a drink or a towel or whatever it is that you forgot. And that's kind of a shame. Or it might be a front desk person who's supposed to be manning the front desk, but instead of doing their actual job, they're running around doing other random things. So wouldn't it be nice if you had robots to do those other random things that improve customer experience, but then lets people do their real job, which is having more face time with the guests. Um, so people who are staff actually do get a little bit of training on how to use this robot. So there is a code. So not no random people can put random things into the <laughs> robot. You do have to be able to put the correct thing in. Um, and be certified. So I really just got a drink, um, and he's gonna come up to my hotel room. You'll notice he's got some sound design to let people know what he's doing before he does it. Um, he doesn't move really suddenly. He doesn't move with these sharp right angles, right? He moves more smoothly. I mean, now he's just showing off. <laughs> uh, his face right now, which you can't see, says, I'm running a delivery, um, and he's coming to my door. Oh, and I got two drinks, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna take these, and his face says, hello, please remove your items. Um, so I got my drinks, so I'm gonna say, all right, I'm all set. Now he's asking, how's your stay? Should we give him five stars? Four stars? Five, five, what's the five? All right, five stars. You did good. <laughs> so he's happy. <laughs> uh, really does a little dance. Right, and then eventually he'll go back to his charging station. So you can see, you know, this might not be a 500 pound mold manipulation platform, but there's a lot of interesting things that you can do in the interaction design and the industrial design of the product that make it, oh, no, I don't need help with anything else, um, that make it, you know, customer centered uh, or user centered, right, for the staff who are interacting with this thing. And so uh, these are actually a bunch of hotels around the Bay Area, if you wanna see them, if you wanna follow up with folks at Savvy Oak, uh, Anthony's here. Um, I have been doing some consulting work for them, and oh my god, these things are so much fun to watch. Uh, it's it's amazing to see people's reactions to meeting a real real robot for the first time because most of us only encounter these in sci-fi, right, or in movies, um, and this one's pretty real. So, just wanted you guys to see that as an example of a real product or real service that's out there in the world. All right, so unlike Relay, who didn't need help, <laughs> most robots do need help, and. You know, it would be nice if you could just tell people make me a sandwich and they'd make you a sandwich, but really that's not how humans work. Um, and so I think there's some really interesting ideas out there from the art community, actually, that we've been drawing now to HRI. And one of those is Casey Kinzer's tweenbot. So this little robot um, rolls forward, says what he wants to do. Actually, that little sign up top says, I'm trying to get to this intersection in New York City, um, and he is cute. Um, <laughs> and that's all he does. So what she did was actually put this in a park in New York City and just ran him. And all he does is roll forward. He can't even turn or beep or do anything but just be cute and say what he wants. And people who are just walking by would pick him up and point him in the right direction. Just random bystanders in New York City. They're busy people. Um, and Tweenbot succeeded at getting to its location, which was pretty nice. Um, a similar project was the Hitchbot from Canada. This guy hitchhiked all the way across Canada, hitchhiked across much of Europe, Got to the United States, only made it to Philadelphia, and then died uh, because we beat him up. Um, 
this is what he looked like at the end. That makes me really sad. And what does that say about us as people? <laughs> but this, it is important to figure out, you know, for these robots, like, we are human beings and we fail all the time, and yet we sort of are forgiving of that and help each other. So is there a way to get people to be a little nicer um, and more helpful for robots too? There's a lot that we know already from human psychology, um, psycholinguistics and linguistic pragmatists about how people get other people to do stuff for them. <laughs> Politeness actually has a lot of strategies that are well known, and so we decided to try that out with robots. So our robot was really bad at grabbing paper, for example, so it might say things to you like, very directly, teach me how to use a copier. That's a very robotic kind of statement. But if you were gonna use a politeness strategy like, oh, uh, the copier seems to break kind of often. <laughs> um, that's a more indirect way of asking for help. Um, another one would be to say, oh, you know, it's a, it's a negative face saving strategy, which is like, I, I don't mean to bother you, but could you please help me with diagnosing the copier? And finally, you kiss up, <laughs> right? And you say, you're really good at dealing with the Xerox machine. Um, could you show me how to do that too? Um, and we tried these strategies across a whole bunch of different situations, right? So say you're ne using indirect um, politeness to be like, oh, that paper under the cabinet's mine. <laughs> like, <laughs> could you help me get it? Um, or the door is blocking my way, which is sort of implying like, could you please help me open the door because my hands are full. Um, and you'll notice, you know, these are kind of small requests for help. We also upped the ante a little bit and said like, drive me to UPS because <laughs> the robot can't make it there. And that's kind of an imposition, that would take a bit of time. Um, or clean all the dirty mugs. Tell me who all of my coworkers are. That's kind of, kind of rude and asking a lot. Um, and so we varied the type of politeness strategy that people saw. We also varied how big um, of an ask it was. Um, and we know from human um, interpersonal interactions that if someone is a peer, they'll treat you differently than if you're um, in a hierarchical social relationship. Um, and similarly, if you're familiar with the person versus unfamiliar, if it's a stranger, you're, you're more likely to not help them as much as if there's someone that you're likely to encounter again and who you met before. Um, so this was the study design, and what we ended up finding was positive politeness was actually more effective um, than the other strategies. People claimed, self-reported that they're more likely to help the robot uh, in this online study. Um, if the robot was more familiar, supposedly they're more likely to help it. Smaller requests, of course, they're more willing to do than bigger ones. Um, and again, positiveness was seen as more appropriate of a request than the other strategies. Um, the more interesting thing, I think, was the qualitative results of like, what, why, right? They're like, well, you know, I, actually I'm just helping people by helping the robot, right? So it's not that I'm fixing the, the Xerox machine, it's that I'm helping my friend to do, make a copy. Right, and so you're sort of reframing that ask. Um, the other one is like, you know, I'm not a robot handler, that's not my job. Um, and so you're seeing different framings of what that relationship should be, um, influencing whether or not they would help. So positive is good, smaller requests are good, familiarity is good, um, and we didn't see a difference in the social hierarchy. But saying you would help is not the same as actually doing it, so we did run a real study in the lab with a real robot, um, similar so to Manuela Veloso's cobots at Carnegie Mellon, where they have robots ask people for directions. Um, there's these other robots who've asked people, like, could you help me find the dude with the red hat? Um, or can you show me directions to this intersection? Um, we actually had a lot of folks who use our telepresence robots who asked for help. They'd say things like, uh, I'm in a Wi-Fi dead zone, could you push me forward like a foot? Um, and that would, that would actually make a really big difference for people operating the robots. Uh, again, so <laughs> is there a way to help the perceived source of the robot? So is, the, is it a person operating the robot who needs help, or is it just an autonomous machine that needs help? Um, or is it maybe like you know, a mechanical Turk bank of people who is operating that robot, which we've seen these days with crowdsourcing? Um, our hypothesis was that with an autonomous robot, people would expect that it should just work, right? It should just do its own thing. Like, why does it need help from me? Um, with a single teleoperator, we were thinking that maybe you'd have a little more social pressure to help because this person's kind of stranded, and if you don't help them, then you're hurting an individual. But then if there's multiple people operating it, like, does that get kind of creepy because now there's this army of people in your space? Um, so we decided to test this empirically. If you were a participant in this study <laughs> here, uh, this is what it would look like. We actually just told people, you're going to come into the lab and watch a movie about robots. And that's it. And it just so happened that our robot's going to come in and interrupt you a few times. Mm -hmm. uh, it had a little light in its head that was an indicator of whether it was autonomous, teleoperated by a person, or by a bunch of people. This is what it looked like from your point of view. I'm watching a movie, and this robot just keeps like offering me stuff and kind of getting in the way. And it looks like we're a bunch of slobs, right? There's like cups lying all over the place, but that was the actual <laughs> manipulation um, for the study. <laughs> so. 
Um, what we did at the end of the study was we said um, the robot would come up and say, hey, could you help me clean up the room for the next participant that's going to come in? And we'd see whether or not people would get up at all to pick up the cups and put them away, um, or they'd refuse to, and how quickly they would do it. Right. So actually, <laughs> this is one of those studies where uh, everything flies in your face and goes in the opposite direction. So multiple teleoperators were actually trusted more than a single teleoperator. Um, people were more likely to help... Uh, the autonomous robot, they're faster to help the autonomous robot than the, the teleoperated ones. Um, and they, yeah, they did it quicker and they, the robot had to ask fewer times for help. Um, why wouldn't they help it? And it would, they would say like, well, I know that it knows how to pick up cans because it brought me a Mountain Dew, so like, why can't it pick up the table? So instead of putting the, the cups in the robot's hand or in the trash, they would actually like, put it on the table in front of the robot and be like, you get it, right? Um, so there's a little bit of a, belief about what the robots should be doing, uh, which is interesting. So people are more willing actually to help the autonomous instead of the teleoperator robots, right? So that went the other direction. And people were more trusting of the multi, um, multiple teleoperators than the single teleoperator. Um, one thing that we think might be going on here is that people are having more empathy for a machine that is fully autonomous. Um, and that when we talk to people about the multi teleoperator situation, like, well, it must be like some professional setting where you have like a call center of people who are trained and trusted, and they're the ones operating the robots, right? And that's different from just some guy who's at home um, driving robots around. Of course, like any study, this one's got a ton of limitations, right? So there's all these other variables that could be playing into whether or not people are helping. Helping behavior is a very social thing, um, and it's influenced by a lot of other stuff. All right, so um, that's going to be all the studies we've got on like people interacting with robot robots that are fully autonomous. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about a different kind that I think are really interesting. So these are more invisible in use. Um, this is probably familiar to you. Um, this is what my friend Dallas looked like to us. He was a voice in a box on a table. Um, he lived in Indiana. We worked in Menlo Park. Um, and so no one really knew what he looked like, but he was just this dude who was always on the phone whenever we had electrical engineering conversations. Uh, and that wasn't so good. <laughs> we uh, would have arguments in those meetings. And whenever we didn't like the things that Dallas was saying, we would hang up on him, <laughs> which is not good. So then his friend actually set up this sort of Skype on a laptop situation, hoping that we'd be less likely to hang up on him. Uh, uh, but, you know, okay, yeah, it's a little weird to turn someone off when you can see their face, and that didn't happen quite as much. But we would um, forget to bring him to meetings sometimes. Um, sometimes really forget, but sometimes maybe not uh, so much. And so he was still dependent on us to get his body there, right? And so one weekend, actually, he and his, his buddy rolled into work and made this. They stole some body parts from the PR2 on the back uh, and basically put Skype on wheels to roll around the office. So now when you don't answer his email, he can come and block your doorway until you do answer his question in his email. <laughs> uh, he can be much more assertive and present. And these things were so useful that um, our team actually built a whole bunch more of them. And we decided, okay, we know that we love these. We know that Dallas has become more of a teammate because of having this, this, this body. Um, but we're also you know, working with a bunch of roboticists, and maybe we're just weird. And so we decided to field it in a bunch of other places just to see what was going to happen. Um, this stuff is not new, right? So Eric Paulos was doing this stuff in the 90s up at Berkeley. I think the thing that is new is that the networks are now able to support video streaming up and down on Wi-Fi all the time. Um, and that makes a really big difference today. So that's why you're seeing more commercial products that are able to do this in the real world. Um, here we go. There are other design directions, of course, that you could take this, right? So that you're seeing a bunch of screens on wheels. Um, Ishiguro will do things that are more humanoid, right, or an android. And so, you know, his robot looks just like him instead of having to have a screen with his face on it. Um, there are trade-offs, right, between the two directions, one of them being, you know, his grad students operate his robot, his students can make him say whatever they want to make him say, um, which is a little weird. So then they made the telenoid, which is a little more, um, it's, a, it's an infant, right, and so it could become anybody. These are very different directions. Um, in case I spew out a little bit of jargon, when I say remote pilot, I'm referring to the person operating the robot. And when I say the local, I mean people who are local to the physical system. Um, we just made up those words. <laughs> They're not cats in stone, but just so you know what, I'm, what I mean when I say it. So again, I mentioned we put in a bunch of companies to see what would happen, just because we were worried that we were just weird. Um, we wanted to see what people do with them. So unlike most studies that are just like maybe a few hours in a lab, these were many, many, many months long. 
Um, actually, they were much longer by the time we finished the study. And these robots were, the remote pilots were located all over the world, um, but their robot bodies were all in the Bay Area because we had to help maintain them. Um, and people kind of did, you know, what they usually do when they're talking. Uh, I think what was more interesting was where they did it. Um, so if you think of like video conferencing systems, right, like the big Cisco or Polycom or Camberg systems, they're usually used in the conference room um, or maybe in a, one of the nice offices. But where these systems were used was actually more in the informal spaces, so hallways uh, and communal spaces, like usually by the coffee machine. Some of our most effective remote pilots would wait until someone was waiting for their coffee to percolate at the coffee machine and they'd pounce on them because you're held captive for a couple of minutes <laughs> while that coffee is going. Um, and you have no choice other than to socialize with this person. Um, Bonnie Nardi has done really interesting work in remote communication, and a lot of the things that she found there are still true with these robots today. I'm going to go through each one of these in turn. Um, just showing up matters, right? Getting your butt in that chair matters. Um, this is one of the directors for Firefox um, at Mozilla, and he was based in Toronto. Um, and he would, instead of dialing into the all-hands meeting just to look through that video camera in the back there, which is what most of the remote workers did, he would show up in robot. And it, yes, it was a little bit disruptive, right? He's actually kind of blocking some people's view, but people in the team felt like he was more present there because he bothered to show up in robot. Um, similarly, capturing attention, right? So being there in person makes it possible for you to block the doorway. <laughs> and get in people's faces. And if you're having an argument, you really get in their face, right? Um, Dallas would actually do this thing to me where he would pounce on me if I didn't answer his emails. And so I started hearing when his robot was coming down the hallway and I knew how he drove because he was very assertive with his driving. Um, and sometimes I would run outside the building because <laughs> I wasn't ready yet to have that conversation. Um, so there are workarounds. Then of course they made a really silent version so I couldn't hear it coming. Um, so, you know, we, we work with what we've got. <laughs> the last one um, I do want to mention, and it sounds super touchy-feely, but this one's actually super important for team building and collaboration. Um, these guys, right, they're, they're hanging out, making fun of the guys playing pool, and they can't play pool because these robots don't have arms. Um, but what they are doing is building rapport, right, and just hanging out with each other as people. Um, and that has actually been shown to improve, in particular, geographically distributed team collaboration because now you treat each other more as people and as teammates as opposed to just the transactional things that are happening because we have to work together um, remotely. So, you know, we did a bunch of these field studies and saw a bunch of really interesting things. And so what we did was ran a bunch of controlled studies to figure out, like, okay, what if we tweak this design variable? What would, what would happen? Would it get better? Um, and then we rinsed and repeated quite a few times. Um, nowadays, you will have probably seen the beam. Um, this is actually an old interface that was uh, towards the end of the Willow Garage days, but this is what it would have looked like then if you were operating the robot. So you would have a little native app on your laptop or your desktop computer, uh, and you just drag your body around. Um, something that people had a hard time with with a lot of these systems was remembering that they don't look like themselves. Uh, and so what we do is put mirrors around the office so that people can have a little more feedback <laughs> about what they look like and how they're presenting themselves to others. Um, so if you want to try these out, Beam actually does uh, trial drives and they're based in Palo Alto. Um, I get this question all the time, so I'm just going to nip it in the bud. Um, this is Shellbot from the Big Bang Theory. That is our robot. <laughs> Everyone says, oh, you just copied the Bing Bang Theory. But actually, like, they're on it, and they're, they saw the YouTube video, I guess, of Dallas running around in his, his little robot. Um, and so they called him up, and Dallas and the crew got to go down and shoot this episode um, with the Big Bang Theory team, which is kind of awesome. And the Waz signed the back of the screen, which is even more awesome. Um, I mentioned, you know, we, we played with a bunch of variables, and I think this one's probably one of the more interesting ones that might be worth talking about. Um, people really, really like to decorate them, right? It's kind of like people putting stickers on their Roombas and stuff. It just happens. And we wanted to know, like, is that actually helping? Um, there is literature in the human-computer interaction space that actually my old advisor, Cliff Nass, did that showed that if you put uh, matching colors and told people that, you know, this blue computer with a blue frame around it is your teammate, and we're going to put a blue wristband on your wrist. It sounds super cheesy. But it actually gets people to identify with the computer as an in-group. They treat it better. They spend more time with it. They like it better at the end of the day. It's um, kind of crazy, but it works. And we are wondering, is that going to work for the robots too? right? So we let people decorate the robots or not and saw what was going to happen. Then they had this conversation that was sort of getting to know you, doing some collaborative decision making. 
Um, and then at the end, we just had them sort of chit chat and see how much they would disclose about themselves to the other person, kind of as an indirect measure of rapport. Um, so half of the people were able to decorate the robot with things that we gave them ahead of time or not. Um, and the other thing that we know affects whether people are, are working well together or are going to play nicely together is we tell them, we're going to grade your performance on this as a team versus we're going to grade your performance on this as an individual. So at the end of the day, you both need to have the right answer or you just need to have the right answer. So that's interdependent versus independent scoring. Um, when you tell people that their scores are going to be tied to each other, they usually like each other more. Um, and yes, people actually disclose more about themselves to partners that they perceived as having interdependence with them. Um, and this is an interesting measure of, of in-groupiness and out-groupiness. If someone is very out-groupy, you tend to ascribe more basic animal-like emotions to them as opposed to more nuanced human-like emotions. So that was consistent. Um, and of course, they like the pilot more if they think they're on their team. Uh, and again, I said, you know, maybe if they decorate it, they're going to feel more team-like with this person. Maybe we're hoping they're going to feel better about that person. Um, and another humbling experience. Um, it went in the exact opposite direction in a very statistically significant way. <laughs> so here, um, when you decorate the robot, you actually don't cooperate with them as much, and you don't really want to talk to them after study. Um, that kind of sucks. <laughs> so what's going on here, right? If we looked at you know computers of social actors, they should have liked it more. Um, and actually, in the debriefing interviews when we talked with them, a lot of people started saying things to us like, oh yeah, I love the robot, but like, who is that dude inside of it, right? They were building a sense of teamness with the machine, but not with the person on the other side. <laughs> that was our mistake. Um, so I think if we were going to run this study again, what we would do is have the remote person and the local person decide how to dress the robot together um, so that they would be building the relationship and they would be building the teamness as opposed to the local person just building it with the robot and only the robot um, and getting offended when someone else inhabited their robot. Um, so that was that was an interesting and humbling experience. So yes, it's fine to decorate them if you do it with the remote pilots. All right, now we're going to get into the messy territory uh, where I think there's actually the most juicy research questions. Um, there are times when things feel very agentic and like they're doing their own thing and at the same time they feel like they're more invisible in use and that gets really complicated. And the telepresence robots are a really good space for exploring this. Um, so I mentioned, you know, we were doing these field studies and we were seeing sort of very different behavior from different sites that started breaking down in some systematic ways that were, that were interesting. Um, people would say things like, uh, <laughs> they'd, they'd go to a meeting and they'd have their conversation and then they would sort of treat it like it was a phone call and just hang up. And that seems like it would be fine except that now you've left a dead robot body in the meeting room and somebody else has to go and push your robot body back to the charging station. And you do that enough times and people start getting a little bit annoyed with you. And so they start yelling at each other and saying things like this. Uh, so some people were using a telephone sort of metaphor for making sense of it. Other people, and this one was super interesting, um, was you know remote operators would start really feeling like that was their body, right? They really inhabit the robot body. And so if someone came up too close to them, and started like poking at their cameras. As a person who's operating that robot, it kind of feels like they're touching you up here, which is a very personal space, right? Like you don't do that to your coworkers. Um, similarly, they'd go and like hit the big run stop button, which kills all power to all your motors because it's a big red button, so they want to hit it, and that, that <laughs> stops your ability to control the machine. Um, and so they get people sort of annoyed with each other um, about touching the machine. There's a lot of useful theories, I think, actually from communication theory that can help us here. So when we see things that are more um, just text-based, for example, we say, you know, it's the New York Times saying this, as opposed to it's an individual, right? Dan Rather says so. That's very different from CBS says so. Um, and also, you know, people do treat computers and robots often as social actors, not exactly in the same way. And these robots are being ascribed a lot more agency than what we actually rationally believe that they have. Um, actually here at Park, there's been a bunch of studies looking at how, what metaphors do people use for making sense of video conferencing, right? So um, many people will talk about these as connecting two spaces to each other. Um, other people will say, oh, it's like having a, a window and it's a virtual window. So it's as if I'm just looking outside the window, but really that's Seattle, um, right on the other side of the wall. Um, that doesn't really work so well for the telepresence robots because windows rolling around on wheels doesn't make a ton of sense. 
Um, and so these actually are a little bit closer, right? So now that you know we have movies like Avatar, we can use that word in the general public and people know what we mean. And so these are more like proxies, right? So for example, like Microsoft had a bunch of these uh, around the office or avatars that would represent you. Or you might be like a little rabbit um, or a squirrel that sits on a table and really your microphone and speaker are in there. Um, we did a whole bunch of qualitative research to try and suss out what are the metaphors that people are using to make sense of these systems because they are pretty new um, and hard to make sense of. And we also watched their behavior. So at the sites that had we would call the most success with the systems, they treated the robots as if they were people, meaning that they would do things like if you were having a group conversation and standing in a space, they would give each other personal space. They would make sure that everyone could see what they were trying to see together. They would speak loud enough that the people and the robots could hear. Um, other sites, there was mostly human behavior, but actually this guy, these guys were close friends. Um, and he got too close to his camera, <laughs> which kind of upset his friend, right? So there's, there's these norms of personal space in the office that are kind of getting violated because now this person feels like he's interacting with a machine, but that person feels like that's his body, um, and that's a mismatch. Um, you also see people hugging when normally they wouldn't, like they, they wouldn't do that in person, um, but they'll do it via robot because it's, he's not there in person, which is kind of interesting. Um, other people just say, no, it's just like some other form of media, right? Like it's like phoning in, it's like Skyping in, it's roboting in, same thing, it's, it's no different. Um, and finally, in particular when they were angry, <laughs> they would just keep calling it robot. So this guy, I felt so bad for him. This is a really beautiful open working space. Um, and so it's also kind of distracting in these open working spaces. This guy logged in and he had turned his camera to the left because he was trying to look at something on a whiteboard. He forgot to turn his camera back straight. So his eyeball's this way, but he thinks it's this way. And he starts zigzagging through the office trying to get to the next meeting room because his eyeball is the wrong way and he's disoriented. Then he gets embarrassed <laughs> that he's banging all around the office, so he starts laughing really loud because someone turned up his volume. Um, and so it seems like he's trying to be a jerk and disrupt everyone, but really he was just having trouble operating the robot. And so his office mates were saying stuff like, we need to put a mute button on that robot. We need to shut that robot down. Um, and they wouldn't say, John's being a jerk, I wish he would stop doing that. They would sort of depersonalize it um, and blame the machine. Uh, this one's also kind of interesting. Other times, like this looks like a normal conversation until you look down at his feet. Um, it just so happened that the robot base looked a lot like an ottoman. <laughs> it was just perfect for resting your feet on them. And if you think about that as like, if he feels like he's a person um, and his boss is putting his feet on your knees, ankles, I don't know what that would be. It's a little bit awkward. Um, and so the new designs of the robot don't afford <laughs> foot resting anymore, because it's kind of awkward. Um, they would treat it more like an it or like a piece of furniture, right? They'd, people would hang their jackets on it. Um, ideally, again, we want it to feel more like a person. And they'd say, you know, it's just like Jonathan was there. And, and I don't even remember. I have had people say, like, I don't remember if this was a conversation we had in person or if it was a conversation we had in robot, because it didn't matter, right? It was just Jonathan. Um, just like the telephone and calling grandma, right? Um, this was one that we didn't expect that I thought was interesting. People would talk about it like a person with disability. So they'd say, well, it doesn't have arms, so I need to go and help it, right? Or they would say, um, oh, well, they're having trouble navigating, so I'm going to go and help them make its way to the meeting room. They would um, take really close-up pictures of the whiteboard and then email it to the person on the other side. Or they would start almost yelling so that the person in the robot could hear. Um, also, I mentioned the Wi-Fi dead zone. So we all think that Wi-Fi covers everywhere, but it really doesn't. There's a ton of dead zones pretty much in every single building because most of us use our laptop, go to a meeting, close it, run to our office, and open it again. But there's actually a bunch of dead zones in between. And so a lot of the robots would be rolling around, and then you hit the Bermuda Triangle <laughs> of Wi-Fi, and you're dead. And we, we called it dead. It wasn't really dead. Um, and so a lot of the remote pilots are saying, like, I really wish I had, like, a medical bracelet that would tell people what to do with my robot dead body um, whenever that would happen, because it happens so often. So I think the way that we sort of made sense of this was um, it, it seemed like as long as people were treating it like a human across the entire organization, it was okay, right? So if I feel like that's my robot body and you respect my personal space as a local, then we're fine. Um, and that kind of raises expectations about how you should behave, right? 
On the flip side, if say, they say, no, it's not a human, it's just a machine, don't worry about it, then it's fine if my coworkers hit my volume buttons on my face um, because I don't feel like it's me anyway. But then you also get some people treating it like it's a thing, meaning that they're gonna you know, race it around the office like it's an RC car. This happens a lot, um, believe it or not. So there are trade-offs to both, and really I think the thing that matters is that the locals and the remote pilots agree on which metaphor they're gonna use. It's when you saw misalignment between those two user groups that you saw more people getting upset <laughs> with each other and with the robot being in their space. Um, so those shared metaphors is really what matters more than which metaphor they picked. Um, and it is definitely possible for the human-like metaphors to go so far. So I, I'm here talking about human-centered robot design. Notice I'm not saying humanoid robot design because they're not the same thing, right? So we're trying to design things that help people to do what people are doing. And in some cases, it might be true that a humanoid form is the best way to do that. And in other cases, it's not, right? So a lot of robots, like the ones in my house, don't look like humans because they have different functional purposes. Um, last that I'm gonna go over real quickly that is pretty relevant to a lot of the stuff that we're seeing today in cars, too. Um, I mentioned the guy who was having trouble navigating that office. He was just like banging all over the place and making lots of noise and laughing at himself. Well, that happens a lot. <laughs> These things are not easy to drive. We forget how hard it was to learn how to drive our cars, right? That took years to learn. It's not that easy. Um, and so what if we could add some autonomous assistance, right? So what we did with the system, um, which is actually the new beans, is you've got a little LIDAR on the base, just like this guy here, and it can detect obstacles, right? And if you detect an obstacle and the remote pilot tries to run into something, you just don't let them. Um, you replan the path, and it's just like the way that other cars do it. Um, so what we did was we gave people an obstacle course in our office that was just like the other offices we really had, and we gave them things like trash cans and tables and chairs to run into, and we told them, you can practice the course as many times as you want, um, and let us know when you're ready, and then we're gonna run a race where you need to run as quickly and as um, error-free as possible. Half of the people were given autonomous assistance, half were not, and we also measured this individual difference um, that comes from personality psychology of locus of control. In, in case you haven't heard of it, um, if I believe that you know, fate is just gonna have its way and when things happen, they just happen and you roll with it, you have a very strong I external locus of control. If you believe that I am the master of my own destiny and if I succeed, it's because of me and if I fail, it's my fault, you have a stronger internal locus of control. Most people are somewhere along that spectrum. Um, it's not really super binary, but you can bucket them if you need to. So, you know, what happened? We figured that if they have autonomous assistance, they're gonna hit fewer things and drive faster. Seems kind of obvious. Um, and yes, they hit fewer things if they had autonomous assistance because we gave them obstacle avoidance. But they actually took longer to finish the obstacle course, which was not what we were expecting. Um, we did have kind of a hunch that maybe those people who need to be in control um, might have trouble with using the autonomous assistance. Um, so the more internal lo locus of control people might take a little bit longer. Um, and that was true. They were, they were having a little more trouble using the robots, uh, or at least they're taking longer to get through the obstacle course. And the, what's really happening is here. So the only significant difference is between this guy and the other three. So if I have a strong internal locus of control, I am in control of my own fate, my own destiny. Um, I don't like having an autonomous assistant. So yes, I know that the system is supposedly gonna help me not run into things, but I'm gonna fight it because I'm the one who's supposed to be driving this thing, not you. Um, and so there are personality differences that maybe we should be taking into account um, as we're adding more autonomous assistance and autonomy into our, into our robots. Um, this has also been coming up in other projects that we were doing at Willow Garage and that are continuing now um, with Robots for Humanity. So Henry Evans is a guy who actually lives just up the hill. Um, and I think 12 years ago, he had a stroke that left him paraplegic and mute. Uh, when he saw the PR2, on CNN, he gave us a call and was like, I wanna use your robot. Um, so our, our team, a uh, pretty big team, figured out a way to, to make it possible for Henry to teleoperate the robot. And for him, what was interesting was that he said, you know, I don't really need an autonomous robot running around helping me to do things. I just wanna do them myself, right? And so having the sense of control, and he actually is in control, like he's teleoperating that thing straight up. It's better for him to be able to scratch his itch than for an autonomous robot to scratch the itch for him, right? Because yeah, you could just hire a caregiver to do that, but it's embarrassing and really I'd rather just do it myself. And so there are gonna be times when we are happy to let go of control 
right? Like, I don't care about exactly how my vacuum cleaner is going to suck dirt in the house. I just want it to be clean. Um, but there are also going to be times when I do want to feel like I'm responsible and I'm the one doing it um, myself. So these are just a quick summary um, of all the stuff that I've talked about today so far. There's a lot more studies, and this field is much bigger than just the stuff that I've been doing. But um, I do want to mention this is totally not done just by me alone. I've had a ton of awesome collaborators to work with um, from a bunch of different institutions that have been really fun and really great. And again, if you guys are interested in this stuff, I'd highly recommend checking out the human-robot interaction community. Like we have an annual conference. There's actually a few conferences um, where you can get involved here, too. And with that, I'm going to open the floor for questions. Thank you. I'll just leave this up here as a reminder, because it was a lot of material. Uh, sorry, there's a microphone here? Yeah. We have two microphones on both sides, and we'll go back and forth. Cool. Thank you very much. I think you kind of bounced around this in kind of an implicit way, but here's my question. Yeah. Um, increasing computer-mediated communication, including human-robot interaction, is bound to alter people's sense of who they are. Yeah. Both privately and socially. Yeah, I totally agree. So, how can human-centered design complement the best parts of human nature, for example, empathy and creativity, as opposed to robotizing yeah. humanity? Yeah, I love that question. Um, so, there's, there's this anecdotal thing that I keep seeing happening that I really want to do some research on, um, and I'm hoping to do it now at Santa Cruz. So, uh, Dallas, my coworker I mentioned, who invented this thing, he's um, six foot two, six foot three. I'm five foot three, <laughs> so I'm usually a foot shorter than him, right? And actually, our robots were five foot two because that was just more mechanically stable to do. Um, and so, I love the robots because they make everyone on par with me. Um, and I remember we were at this cocktail party, and I was wrangling Dallas to make sure he didn't run over anybody's feet. Um, and he was taking me in, in the robot, right? So he had a beer at his house, and he was logged into this cocktail party in San Francisco with us. And he was like, nobody's talking to me. I can only see their shoulders. This really sucks. Like, I think we need to make the robot taller. And I told him, no. <laughs> like, you get to walk in my shoes for tonight, right? And he actually, over time, became a lot more empathetic about what it was like to be in a body that's my height. And so now, when I do see him in person, he'll do things like sit down to talk with me instead of stand over me, which is he will do. Um, and I really appreciate it. Like, I really do think it helps him build empathy. Um, there's also been folks, Jeremy Balinson over at Stanford's done a lot of work in VR and how if you change an avatar's race or gender, you can get them to be more empathetic towards what it's like to be, have that race or have that gender. And I think we could use these systems to build more empathy. It would make me really sad if what happened was these made us more socially awkward and more robotic. Um, but I do think there is there is there's some nuggets of promise for making them more human and making us more more interpersonally capable, <laughs> right? Better able to, to walk in each other's shoes. Yeah. Great question. Okay, following on to that question, actually, it's so disappointing to see the poor robot get beat up in Philadelphia. No. So I wonder if you've got any updates on the Uncanny Valley. I oh, mean, because one might have thought that would have been a sympathetic robot, according to that theory. Yeah, uh, there's been a lot of studies on the Uncanny Valley. I'm still not sure if that curve is perfectly correct. It's definitely culturally grounded, right, um, and, and different across cultures. Like, some people would say that the Hitchbot was kind of creepy. Right, and that's why it bothered them. Other people would say, well, it's really appealing and cute, and you should have helped it. And so I do think there is going to be individual difference and at least cultural difference in like how people, where that drop off happens. For those of you who haven't heard the Uncanny Valley, um, it's this idea that like things become more and more and more human like, and then if you get too close to human like, it's just creepy. It's like zombies, right, or dead bodies. <laughs> and, then, and then once you're super human like, you're fine again, right? So the perfect android. Um, and I do think that there is, I'm not sure if the uncanny valley is the right way of framing it, but I do think there's really interesting questions and important questions around creepiness and like, what is that? What is it that's triggering that response from us um, to perceive creepiness because it's clearly having negative effects on our behavior <laughs> towards these machines. Um, and I, it, it does seem to vary a lot. Uh, like I've tried piloting a few studies and I'm just seeing really big individual difference in noise. Um, so I think maybe there's variables that we're not accounting for yet. Um, that are not just human, but are also, there's, there's these other layers, right, on top of it. Yeah. 
So what does the mobility with the screen add to the interaction that I don't have if I use a screen, yeah. which in the workspace is everywhere. I have it in my pocket, I yeah. have it in a conference room, I have it at my desk, yeah. uh, I have it in the break room, I have it in the cafeteria. Yeah. So why not just abandon the mobility and just move the face from screen to screen instead? Yeah, so I mean like Skype right now, or most of the teleconferencing systems that we have. Um, we have actually just submitted a paper <laughs> for review um, on exactly this question. So one difference with the mobility is that now I am, I as a remote person, am in control of where I am, right? So like I can roll into your office. I don't have to wait for you to bring me up on your iPad. Um, so the control is now in the hands and the responsibility is in the hands of the remote person, not the local. And they're actually the one benefiting, right? So the person who's remote is usually the one suffering in the communication and teamwork. Um, and so they're more invested in doing the work to get where they need to be. The other one is that motion actually makes us feel more present. And so we've been running studies where we have the exact same robot body perfectly still during a, a conversation versus just kind of moving around a little bit, right? So like in video game design, they call it the keep alive motion. Um, and just that little bit of motion increases um, presence and rapport and engagement um, behaviorally, which is kind of, important, right? Because like when we're here in person, we, we don't stand perfectly still. Um, and Doug Dooley, actually, our animation friend, he would tell me these stories about how in animation, um, the character who's the most still is the one in control of the situation. So it's usually like the bad guy. <laughs> it's the reason why cowboys will like stare at the sun as it sets and not move, right? And usually the one who's like wiggling around and having a lot of like twitches and stuff, they're the ones who are not in control of the situation. And so when our robots are very still, it's actually kind of intimidating for the rest of us because it's as if it's communicating that I'm the one in control and you're not. Um, and I think making these robots more approachable is a really big deal for, for especially in our culture, where we're a little more intimidated by machines than maybe in more um, East Asian cultures, for example. So the motion turns out to make a big difference. Um, I mean, a lot of the folks that I know who, I mean, I use Skype and Google Hangouts and all that stuff too when I have to, but if I can, I will use the telepresence one because I have more presence and people will pay more attention to me. Um, so if the robot rolls into the, my office, yeah. I respond and say, oh, yeah. John's just arrived. Yeah. But if won't I learn to, to just ignore him like I can ignore a text message or I could ignore a FaceTime request or I can record ignore Skype? It's hard. Is that just <laughs> learned behavior? Uh, I think because it's more like when John would be there Right? Like, it's hard to ignore someone standing in your doorway, socially. Uh, it's a lot, I mean, I tried. That's why I ended up running away from Dallas when I didn't want to talk to him, because I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't able to just ignore him when he rolled up to me. And people, you will see actually their personalities come through the way they drive the robot. So more um, aggressive or more extroverted people will make bigger motions and they'll get closer to you and talk loud. Um, whereas like at the cocktail party, the people who are more shy and introverted would literally stand in the corner and look at their feet. Um, and be more quiet, and you'd have to encourage them to go and talk with people. And so the more aggressive people in particular, Dallas is like super friendly and chatty, and so he'd be up in your face um, with this robot. It'd be almost impossible to ignore. Um, a lot of them will also figure out that you can knock on the door by like running your robot into the door a bunch of times. <laughs> like, they will find ways to get your attention if they want it, because <laughs> humans are resourceful. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Hi. Can we talk about GPS for a moment? Sure. I would argue that GPS is kind of like a robot, except that it's telling us what to do mm. instead of the other way around. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm a little concerned about friends I have who say, oh, I don't even know where I'm going anymore. I just follow my GPS. Oh, boy. And so the question becomes, are we seeing a transition between intro, internal and external in the sense that we are now just starting to follow robots' instructions yeah instead of being, quote, the masters of our own destiny, unquote. Right. Are we relinqu relinquishing control and skills? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and that's just right. And if right. you are in a place where your Wi-Fi gives out and right. you then don't know so where you trouble. are or where you, how you got there and where you're going to get home, you've lost that autonomy and handed it over to your robot. Yeah, I do feel like that with my GPS navigation system. I just I just moved to Santa Cruz. So I don't know where I'm going ever, and I have been relying on Google Maps a lot. And um, I have found that now I've been turning it off just so that I have to learn 
the roads myself. I mean, the, I guess you could argue this about a lot of autonomy, right, that's coming to our system. So like some of us know how to drive manual transmission cars, but some of us don't, right, because it's become so reliable now and so pervasive that it doesn't matter if you don't know how to use a clutch to drive. But I would argue that even with navigation, like it's, I don't know if it's reliable enough for us to start giving up um, those skills and that control yet. Um, this is a super interesting direction. I mean, also with like, w along with control and skill is responsibility, right? So like I've seen people um, operate the telepresence robots and kids in particular will forget that there's actually a person on the other side and that's the real world on the other side. It's not a game. This is not Ender's game. Like <laughs> there, there's a real thing happening on their side. And so they'll run around and try to like hit people with the robot um, thinking that it's a game and it's kind of interesting, like I wonder if it's the interface design that's doing that, that's making them not not act responsibly, right? Like you're gonna hurt a real human being on that other end. Um, it's, they're not characters that you get points for knocking into. Um, yeah, those are, I don't have any answers for that, but I think those are super interesting questions that we, we should be digging into more, especially as there's more, more machine learning, more autonomy um, being inserted into our systems, just like the, the obstacle avoidance, right? Like it's gonna work but maybe not all the time, and until it does work reliably, we do need to sort of have our wits about us and skills still to operate when they don't work. Yeah. Hi, I'd like to play devil's advocate a little bit. Sure. So people are extremely adaptable, right? We have thrown all sorts of technologies at, um, like we have cars, we have planes, we have computers, we have cell phones, and yeah. we embrace all of that, and yeah. we work fine with all of it. Just given that, is it really important to make the robot adapt to people? Wouldn't we just, you know, we throw the robots in around us and we'll just mm -hmm. run with it? Yeah, I think, so my argument for that is cars have so much value for us because they get us so much farther than we could get with our own bodies, right? And because they're so valuable, we're willing to put up with the years of learning to how to drive them. <laughs> Um, and so if the value that the thing provides us is worth the pain of learning how to use the thing, then sure, we'll do it. But honestly, like most of our robotic products out there are not that valuable. They're just robots. Don't you want a robot in your home? And you're like, what does it do for me? Like, I don't know, it's a robot, right? And so you're like, why would I put up with this thing? You know, it's, it becomes just a gimmick. Um, whereas I think if the robots do serve a purpose and provide a lot of value, then maybe we're gonna, we'll put up with more friction. Um, and then it becomes, you know, competition in the marketplace, right? Like, if you are more human-centered by design uh, and the competition's not, then guess which way the consumers are probably gonna go, right? The one, with, go with the company that respects you more <laughs> and is gonna put the, the effort and the cycles and hire designers, right, to, to design the system instead of just build something that works, right? I think it's gonna become a competitive advantage um, to be more human-centered by design, just like the PC, right? Um, it's not gonna play out exactly like the personal computer, but I think there's some lessons we can pull from there. For the relay robot? Sorry, where, oh, okay, <laughs> yeah. Was it a design decision not to use uh, voice to interact with it? Yes. Or uh, technical problem? So, um, yeah, my, so my friend Adrian Canoso is the designer for the system, um, and he's an amazing industrial designer. Um, part of the, Again, you know, thinking about what are we promised and what can, what can we deliver on. Um, this actually started a few years ago, and at that point in time, I don't think we were ready to say that the robot's going to understand anything that you're going to say to it, <laughs> right? And so, if you want the system to be reliable enough that people are going to put up with it long enough for it to provide value to the hotel guests, um, then the reliability of the system matters more than it being able to understand speech. And so, one thing that is done here, you'll notice like that sound design didn't have any speech in it, right? And part of the reason for that is because if the robot talks, then people expect that it should understand them talk back. Um, and so instead of using language um, acoustically, they do it on the screen. Um, because then people sort of, oh yeah, know what a tablet is, right? And they just start poking in um, there and that works. But I think, you know, if, if <laughs> natural language processing gets to the point where it is robust enough, then maybe I think we will see a switch um, because people want to talk to these. They talk to them all the time. <laughs> and, you know, he just blinks at you, but he's not understanding what you're saying right now. 
Um, but that is a super hot area of research, right, with more, more chatbots, more dialogue designers, um, and with robots, like things that have faces, people just assume that they're gonna understand what you're saying. Um, it's just, it's, the AI is not quite ready yet. Um, actually, my old Clip, uh, my, my PhD advisor worked on Clippy at Microsoft a very long time ago. Um, and his argument for why Clippy was such a massive failure was because the design team um, was told that Clippy can, is super smart and can figure out anything and it's state of the art AI and so users can throw anything at it and he's gonna be amazing. So they designed the character to be super smart. Um, but then when they actually put the back end on Clippy and it was really dumb, right, then now you're acting as if you're super smart but you're, you can't actually deliver on that promise and so people got mad um, at that character. And now we have a fear of doing that again um, because you can poison the well pretty for a while, <laughs> right, if you don't deliver on your promise. And so the interaction designers need to be in sync um, with that AI team to make sure that they're promising um, on things that they can actually do robustly enough for a user to make use of it. We'll get there. I think we're just not there quite yet. Last question, and then we'll um, uh, end it from there. Thanks for the wonderf wonderful talk. Uh, I had one question about, are uh, humans more uh, responsive towards uh, Android-like design, or do they like simple, you know? Uh it depends, uh, as always, right? So usually, um, I mean, I've run studies, for example, actually, let's back up. A really cool study that I didn't do, um, and it was done by Sarah Kiesler, this amazing person at Carnegie Mellon. Um, she did a study on pet rocks. <laughs> and they look at people who had pet rocks that had faces that people had painted faces on versus pet rocks that didn't. And, you know, you could sort of compare that to androids versus, you know, Roombas, for example. Um, and people would actually ascribe more agency and less attachment to the pet rocks that had faces <laughs> than the ones that didn't. The ones that didn't, they, like, held in their pocket more, they kept really close to them, they made them feel calmer, but the ones with faces sort of, like, got their own thing going on, even though they're just rocks. Um, and I am starting to see kind of similar things with the robots. So robots that have faces are promising something more, right, than the robots that don't. And so we start like they're gonna do their own thing and have more autonomy and therefore we might actually be less inclined to mess with them or interact with them depending on how you design a character. Um, and the, ri the big it depends is really like what are you trying to do with it, right? Like if I just want it to vacuum, I just want it to mop or cut my lawn, like it doesn't need, I don't want an Android. Um, but if I'm Disney, right, and I wanna have these amazing interactive animatronic experiences in my park, then sure, right? And then it makes a ton of sense. It, it really depends on the context and the, the function, um, as opposed to just like, should it be stimulated, should it not, I think. So there's, there's space for all of them <laughs> to exist, just they're different niches. So thanks so much, um, Leila. We appreciate you coming tonight. Um, as you can see here on the screen, we already have scheduled the next park forum, which is going to be October uh, 27th. Uh, the Experience When Business Meets Design, and that's with Brian Solis. So please mark your calendars, and you can register online on through our website. So once again, let's give a round of applause to Dr. Takayama. Thank you very much. Thank you.